Good morning to everyone. We're transmitting live from San Diego, California, from the studios of KPBS on the campus of San Diego State University. Greetings to our participants in Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Paraguay, Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, and other countries in Latin America. And we would like to thank once again Telecomunicaciones de Mexico, PanamSat, and BrazilSat for their satellite linkages services, which allow us to reach all of you through the wonders of telecommunications. Welcome to the program Developing International Business Alliances, the Extended Organization, the fourth video conference in our 1996 series, Strategies for Global Competitiveness. My name is Frank Medeiros, and I will be your moderator for this video conference. We would like to remind the coordinators at each receive site to collect the attendance sheets for your sites and mail them to the International Training Center along with a list of participants interested in obtaining the certificate or diploma for this series of programs. This program is composed of three presentation modules and two question and answer sessions. We look forward to your live participation. The liberalization of world trade and the growth of investment across borders have opened business opportunities never before envisioned by organizations in industrialized and developing nations. Far beyond the well-established multinational corporations, there is a growing contingent of medium and small size companies that are extending their organizations through international business alliances and joint ventures in order to participate in new markets abroad or to solidify their domestic market positions with better quality products. This video conference will discuss the principles and strategies of such business alliances, particularly in the context of NAFTA and the gradual integration of free trade throughout the Western Hemisphere. It is my pleasure to present to you today's guests and expert speakers, Mr. Stanley Schultz, Mr. George Gonzalez, and Mr. Pat Rossi. Mr. Schultz is an international business consultant and entrepreneur. For many years, he has been active in the U.S. and foreign markets as a marketer, distributor, and manufacturer, particularly in Latin America. His background includes that of merchant, property owner, university and college instructor, and lecturer. He is president of the Schultz Companies, established in 1924, a graduate of the University of Southern California. He holds a master's in management and an MBA degree. In addition, he was a consultant with McDonnell Douglas in their counter trade and offset program in Finland, Yugoslavia, Austria, and Hungary. <laughs> Mr. Gonzalez uh, obtained his Juris Doctor's degree in 1976 from the University of California at Los Angeles. He is a partner with the international law firm of McKenna and Cuneo, resident in the firm's San Diego, California office. Mr. Gonzalez practices in the area of domestic and international business transactions and international trade. He provides counsel to foreign clients establishing business in the United States and to foreign and U.S. clients engaged in international business transactions, including joint ventures, establishing branch offices or subsidiary operations, sales, licenses, financing foreign agency, and related business relationships. Mr. Gonzalez represents companies in a wide variety of corporate and business affairs, including those involved in construction, the energy industry, manufacturing, international trade, and other business services. Mr. Pat Rossi is Vice President and Trade Finance Specialist for the San Diego Orange County offices of the California Union Bank a subsidiary of the recently formed Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi Bank merger. This group is now known as the largest banking financial institution in the world, with a global network of more than 400 offices and branches. Mr. Rossi is a highly recognized expert in export finance 
and international payment risk mitigation, having graduated from the Pennsylvania State College system at the Mansfield University campus. His distinguished professional career includes 12 years as a maritime and political risk insurance specialist for Lloyd's of London, manager with Caroon and Black Insurance Brokers in Seattle, Washington, and more recently, Union Bank in San Diego. He was president of the prestigious World Trade Club of Seattle and has recently completed a five-year term on the board of directors of the World Trade Center of San Diego. He has written a number of articles and reports on letters of credit, financial risk in developing countries, and export finance strategies. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, I, w I would like to ask the following question. Is the concept of partnering or joining forces with other organizations to increase the regional or international scope of our business or service efforts riskier than doing it by yourself? In other words, uh, we're, we're talking here about the, the positive and perhaps uh, negative aspects of joint ventures. I wonder what you might think about that concept. Well, I would preface my answer by saying that it depends a great deal on the background or the expertise or the experience that a given company has had in the international arena. Uh, if this is a first-time venture uh, into another country, I would say that uh, doing it themselves would be highly risky. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first thing that would come to my mind. I'd, I'd add that uh, I, I think it's essential that companies interested in joint venturing with companies abroad uh, do in-depth um, uh, due diligence uh, and, and understand who they're working with, feel confident in the abilities of that company uh, to, to perform as expected uh, and, and to um, deliver as represented. Uh, due diligence will help to ensure that those things will happen uh, and, and risk will be minimized for a company without experience outside of the country. And, and this is for both, both sides, for, correct? Well, yeah, any company, yes. regardless of where they, are, where they are. You know, Frank, it's important to note, too, that uh, the banking institutions uh, are very good partners as well with a uh, company who wishes to go abroad mm -hmm. uh, because it's a service that a bank offers in uh, seeking out a joint venture partner often a world-class bank uh, has offices in that country has relationships with uh, potential partners mm -hmm. that you may wish to work with and uh, can do a lot of the due diligence and homework in selecting a small number of companies to which it would like to bring together uh, through an introductory process and then watch these two companies uh, as they begin to develop a relationship and, and uh, monitor what comes from that. And we found through the Bank of Tokyo system, for example, uh, that this has been very worthwhile, extremely successful. Uh, particularly in the Asian markets, mm -hmm. but I think this is uh, true throughout the world. Certainly applicable to Latin America. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into this uh, subject uh, in more detail later on in the program, but now let us uh, begin Module 1, in which Mr. Schultz will, dis will uh, discuss some, some basic business strategies organizations involved in joint venturing might utilize in developing their global markets. Thank you. I'm pleased to once more have the opportunity to speak to you. First, I will briefly review some of the concepts and topics covered in my last presentation. Following this review, I will expand on some specific topics, particularly in the area of the concept of the extended organization. I have selected the following main topics. First, that of global competitiveness. Secondly, the topic of the extended organization and developing international alliances. And ultimately, what kind of business alliance best suits you and your organization. 
time permitting, I will briefly address the methodology and implementation of the business plan. First, though, let's quickly review globalization itself by definition and its effect on large, medium, and small business organizations. Throughout my remarks today, I will leave the area of governmental trade agreements and financial mechanisms to my much more knowledgeable fellow speakers, experts in these areas, Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Rossi. Let us begin by defining globalization. To do so, we must understand global economic integration. The globalization of our daily lives is evident everywhere, from the products we buy and use to the attention paid to exchange rate movements in the morning newspaper. Globalization is not simply a matter of increased trade. We see it also in the worldwide markets for currencies and credit, in the pattern of production, and in the flow of information and technology. At the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, new ideas took decades to filter even across Europe. Now they spread around the world at the speed of light. Today, we hear calls for protectionism and economic nationalism. History shows that it is wrong to heed these, those calls. Globalization and rapid economic advance are joined together. They are one. Global integration is the best way for all countries, rich and poor, large and small, to become wealthier together. We must create a world in which people are free to buy what they want, live and work where they choose, and invest and produce where conditions seem most advantageous. There should be unlimited freedom for individuals to trade within and across national borders, widespread international division of labor, and worldwide economics interdependence. One concept should prevail, though. Where there is free trade, there must be fair trade. We cannot have a one-sided coin. With regards to global regionalism, uh, only a global regionalism that ignores national boundaries makes sense. Local communities will automatically develop natural partners, sometimes close geographically, sometimes remote. Through these pairings, alert regions with global views and aspirations will develop and prosper. The same way that alert companies with a global perspective are already prospering. For example, Colombia can flourish through its ties with Mexico and Venezuela via G3 and NAFTA with the United States and Canada. The principal role of governments in a borderless world as I see it is to represent and protect the interests of its people, not of its companies or its industries. It should let in the light and then allow its people to make its own choices. Globalization requires the personal transformation of managers and, as a result, the complete transformation of the company. That is the real issue posed by global markets. Nothing less than a new kind of corporation a truly global orientation makes new demands on strategy, organizational behavior, and organizational structure. It is easy to assess competitive conditions and to decide to make the leap to transnational status. I think it is becoming clear that in many cases, a decisive move, as in a cross-border joint venture, is the best and safest way to start on the road to global status. Mergers and acquisitions are too final and cast in concrete for the first venture of a company into a transnational program. Should they not be successful, the divorce procedure can be very costly and stressful. Strategic alliances can be too vague and not sufficiently binding to protect the parties. I favor the joint venture, particularly with a company in another country that has been successful in the same field as yours. In my last presentation, I discussed what features describe and distinguish transnational corporations 
and how companies move beyond traditional international and multinational models to adopt genuinely transnational strategies in which global efficiencies and responsiveness to local conditions complement rather than contradict each other. Let us now get to the meat of my remarks today. Let's talk about the strategy dictated by globalization. Let's now discuss the area of global competitiveness. Firms, not nations, compete in international markets. We must understand how firms create and sustain competitive advantage in order to explain what role the nation plays in the process. In modern international competition, firms need not be confined to their home nation. They can compete with global strategies in which activities are located in many countries. We must pay particular attention to how global strategies contribute to competitive advantage because they recast the role of the home nation. I will begin with the basic principles of competitive strategy. Many of the principles are the same, whether competition is domestic or international. Having set this foundation, I will turn to the ways in which firms enhance their competitive advantage through competing globally. The principles of strategy will define what attributes of a nation are relevant. The basic unit of analysis for understanding competition is a business sector or industry. An industry, whether product or service, is a group of competitors producing products or services that compete directly with each other. A strategically distinct industry encompasses products where the sources of competitive advantage are similar. Examples are facsimile machines, low-density polyethylene, heavy-on-highway trucks, and plastic injection molding equipment. There may be related industries that produce products that share customers, technologies, or channels, but they have their own unique requirements for competitive advantage. In practice, drawing industry boundaries is inevitably a matter of degree. Two central concerns underlie the choice of a competitive strategy. The first is the industry structure in which the firm competes. Industries differ widely in the nature of competition, and not all industries offer equal opportunities for sustained profitability. The average profitability in pharmaceuticals and cosmetics is extremely high, for example, while it is, it is not in many kinds of apparel and steel industries. The second central concern in strategy is positioning within an industry. Some positions are more profitable than others, regardless of what the average profitability of the industry may be. Neither concern by itself is sufficient to guide the choice of strategy. A firm in a highly attractive industry, for example, may still not earn satisfactory profits if it has chosen a poor competitive positioning. Both industry structure and competitive position are dynamic. Industries can become more or less attractive over time as barriers to, ent to entry or other elements of industry structure change. Competitive position reflects an unending battle among competitors. Industry attractiveness and competitive position can both be shaped by a firm. Successful firms not only respond to their environment, but also attempt to influence it in their favor. <clears throat> Indeed, it is changes in industry structure or the emergence of new bases for competitive advantage that underlie substantial shifts in competitive position. Japanese firms became international leaders in television sets, for example, on the strength of a shift toward compact, portable sets and the replacement of vacuum tubes with semiconductor technology. One nation's firms supplant another's in international competition when they are in a better position to perceive or respond to such changes. Competitive strategy must grow out of a sophisticated understanding 
of the structure of the industry and how it is changing. In any industry, whether it is domestic or international, the nature of competition is embodied in five competitive forces. First, the threat of new entrants. Secondly, the threat of substitute products or services. Third, the bargaining power of suppliers. Fourth, the bargaining power of buyers. And fifth, the rivalry among the existing competitors. The strength of the five forces varies from industry to industry and determines long-term industry profitability. In industries in which the five forces are favorable, such as soft drinks, mainframe computers, database publishing, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetics, many competitors can earn attractive returns on invested capital. Industries in which pressure from one or more of the forces is intense, such as rubber, aluminum, many fabricated metal products, semiconductors, and small computers are ones where few firms are very profitable for long periods. The five competitive forces determine industry profitability because they shape the prices firms can charge, the costs they have to bear, and the investment required to compete in the industry. The threat of new entrants limits the overall profit potential in the industry because new entrants bring new capacity and seek market share, pushing down margins. Powerful buyers or suppliers bargain away the profits for themselves. Fierce competitive rivalry erodes profits by requiring higher costs of competing such as for advertising, sales expense, or research and development, or by passing on profits to customers in the form of lower prices. The presence of close substitute pro uh, products limits the price competitors can charge without inducing substitution and eroding industry volume. The strength of each of the five competitive forces is a function of industry structure or the underlying economic and technical characteristics of an industry. Buyer power, for example, is a function of such things as the number of buyers, how much of a firm's sales are at risk to any one buyer, and whether a product is a significant fraction of buyers' own costs, which leads to price sensitivity. The threat of entry depends on the height of barriers to entry, such as brand loyalty, economies of scale, or the need to penetrate distribution channels. In addition to responding to and influencing industry structure, firms must choose a position within the industry. Positioning embodies the firm's overall approach to competing. In the chocolate industry, for example, American firms such as Hershey and M&M Mars compete by mass producing and mass marketing relatively limited lines of standardized candy bars. In contrast, Swiss firms such as Lindt, Sprungli, and Tober Tobler Jacobs sell mainly premium products at higher prices through more limited and specialized distribution channels. They produce hundreds of separate items utilize top quality ingredients, and manufacture using longer processing times. As this il example illustrates, positioning involves a firm's total approach to competing, not just its product or target customer group. At the heart of positioning is com In the long run, firms succeed relative to their competitors if they possess sustainable competitive advantage. There are two basic types of competitive advantage, lower cost and differentiation. Lower cost is the ability of a firm to design, produce, and market a comparable product more efficiently than its competitors at prices at or near competitors. Lower costs translate into superior returns. Korean steel and semiconductor producers, for example, have successfully competed against foreign competitors using this strategy. They produce comparable products at very low cost 
employing low wage but highly productive labor uh, forces and modern process technology purchased or licensed from foreign suppliers. Differentiation is the ability to provide unique and superior value to the buyer in terms of product quality, special features, or after-sales service. German machine tool producers, for example, compete with differentiation strategies involving high product performance, reliability, and responsive service. Differentiation allows a firm to command a premium price, which leads to superior profitability, provided costs are comparable to those of competitors. The other important variable in positioning is competitive scope. Competitive scope is the width of the firm's target within its industry. A firm must choose the range of product varieties it will produce, the distribution channels it will employ, the types of buyers it will serve, the geographic areas in which it will sell, and the array of related industries in which it will also compete. One reason that competitive scope is important is because industries are segmented. In nearly every industry, there are distinct product varieties, multiple distribution channels, and several different types of customers. Segments are important because they frequently have differing needs. An unadvertised basic shirt and a designer shirt are both shirts, but both are sold to different buyers with different purchasing criteria. Serving different segments requires different strategies. It is quite typical for firms from one nation to ch achieve success in one industry segment. For example, Taiwan in inexpensive leather footwear and Italy in fashion leather footwear. The type of advantage and the scope of advantage can be combined into the notion of generic strategies or different approaches to superior performance in an industry. In shipbuilding, for example, Japanese firms follow the differentiation strategy, offering a wide array of high-quality vessels at premium prices. Korean shipyards pursue the cost leadership strategy, also offering many types of vessels, but ones of good, not superior quality. Korean firms, however, can produce vessels at lower cost than can Japanese firms. Successful Scandinavian yards are focused differentiators, concentrating on specialized types of ships, such as icebreakers and cruise ships that involve specialized technology and which command prices high enough to offset higher Scandinavian labor costs. Finally, Chinese shipyards who are pursuing a cost focus and who are the emerging competitors in the industry offer relatively simple, standard vessel types at even lower costs and prices than the Koreans. Firms create competitive advantage by perceiving and discovering new and better ways to compete in an industry and bringing them to market, which is ultimately an act of innovation. The most typical causes of innovations that shift competitive advantages are the following. One, new technologies. Two, new or shifting buyer's needs. Three, the emergence of a new industry segment. Four.